All right. So if you will, we'll get All right. Time. Well, good morning, everyone, and thank you for joining us this morning. I'm Ann Gill, the president and CEO of the Tempe Chamber, and uh, excited because this morning we have nearly 50 years of employment law experiences, experience helping us navigate new questions that the COVID-19 pandemic has created for our employers and how to address employee concerns. So Gamage and Burnham is one of the most highly respected full service business law firms here in Arizona. Um, they've been rooted in our state since 1983 and Gamage and Burnham you know, remains locally owned and operated and has been a valued member of the Tempe Chamber for more than 10 years. Uh, our presenters this morning are Julie Pace and Heidi Nunn Gilman, and between the two of them, uh, we've got some great experience to guide us through some of these new um, laws and information that's coming up. Um, so I will go ahead and turn it over to Julie Pace and Heidi, and I'll let you guys take it from here. Um, and for those of you on the call, if you can uh, put your questions in the Q&A, uh, we will take that question and, and monitor those as we go along. And so going from here, um, I hope everyone can uh, share the screen. So Suki, can we see the screen? You'll need to share um, the slides, please. All right, let's, uh, give me one moment. All right, good morning. We're waiting, and Suki's gonna put the PowerPoint up. But uh, this is Julie Pace, and thank you, Anne, for putting this together. Um, such an important topic for everybody. And yes, we will try to take questions, and if we don't get to them all when you do the chat rooms, we will definitely um, follow up afterwards. Uh, we had a little bit of technical difficulty this morning, but I think we're working through it. Um, I think firewalls were blocking some of us from, from uh, loading some things. So while Suki is doing her magic on loading, let me, uh, so we'll start in a little bit. Um, so my name again, Julie Pace, and my partner Heidi Nunn Gilman is here, and Suki's got the PowerPoints up. Um, so we're going to cover everything, a kind of a how-to step-by-step on what's going on with this new family first uh, coronavirus act and how does it impact your business and then also how does that impact the other leaves that are available from workers comp and what about the OSHA 300 log and do you have to report these things on your website and how do you deal with it if someone tests positive or is exposed and what about furloughs and layoff and how does unemployment handle uh, the situation and we do want to give you that next page of a disclaimer we're going to give you a lot of generalities today but details about the law but just keep in mind that your own personal company situation um, might be different. So that's all. We always put that important legal notice in there. And then we have the quote from on paragraph on PowerPoint three from Harry Truman. We always think this is a good time to remind us all that America was not built on fear. America was built on courage, on imagination, and an unbeatable determination to do the job at hand. Um, so keep that in mind. Um, you know, we have to remind and motivate our employees. Uh, we have to keep them uh, moving forward and, um, you know, motivated for difficult times to improvise, adapt, and overcome. So we just have been using that quote, and it's just a reminder of, you know, people improvise, adapt, and overcome all the time, part of the world today, and they're seeing more of that than ever. All right, what is the COVID-19? So let's start with the basics. We know what it is, where it came from. Um, it's been classified as a pandemic, and um, the symptoms are what we really want to remind everyone. If people are ill at work at all, uh, we need to make sure that they are not showing up at work for any reason because of the uh, potential to make other people feel and sick and make their immune systems come down. So PowerPoint 5 gives you some symptoms and things to watch through both for being ill generally, and then also for uh, symptoms of COVID. So two things they've told us, if someone's ill at all, any other non-COVID, they're still supposed to not be at work because it brings the immune systems down of other people. If they have COVID symptoms, which are difficulty breathing, shortness of breath, coughing, fever, it's a low grade fever, 100.4, or the loss of smell or taste. We've had a lot of people, um, Heidi and I have been dealing with a lot of situations where um, 
employees have lost their ability to smell and taste. And what's happening is uh, they didn't realize that. And that's the only symptom they had in the workforce. And then all of a sudden, all these other people came down sick, and that was a problem. And then we have people who are um, over 60 who have other illnesses that make them more immune compromised or asthma, diabetes, heart conditions to be sensitive to. So how is it transmitted? The primary way, as we know, is from droplets from the nose or mouth. That's why everybody's saying now to do the cloth face. The CDC is saying use cloth mask, face mask as you're working um, with others within six feet. And also watch the surface. Um, those surfaces um, can be can last a while and sometimes not. Glass is actually the longest surface that they, the droplets stay on for hours to days. Others are very quick. So high touch areas, you need to watch um, what you're doing. Governor Ducey's executive order, let's talk about that on PowerPoint 7. So executive order 2020-18, stay home, stay healthy, stay connected. So individuals can leave their homes to conduct essential activities or employment, volunteer, participate in essential functions, utilize services um, if your employee is a sole proprietor or family-owned business. So a lot of people got confused when this came out and didn't realize um, that who is an essential service and who's not. Uh, so we did list on PowerPoint 8, the next PowerPoint, the actual essential activities that are included. Um, and so there's a whole list of them. Uh, but many companies were still allowed, as long as they're practicing best practices, and implicit in the actual executive order was best practices. So keep that in mind. Um, best practices are the things that we keep teaching. Wear the cloth mask. Uh, you have to uh, make sure you're cleaning your high-touch areas regularly that you actually train your employees. Um, we prefer that everyone be trained because it was implicit in there that they were supposed to be doing toolbox talks, safety talks, we've been drafting them for the field and office. And in fact, OSHA has also said you're supposed to have for those companies that are essential services, a what we're calling a coronavirus or COVID-19 uh, prevention, preparation and, res uh, and response plan. So that way, if your customers ask, if you ask, if your employees ask, you have your plan built in there of what you're going to do about positive tests, uh, exposures to tests, um, and also minimizing the risk to flatten the curve. Okay, so um, all the way from 8, 9, 10, 11 is just all the businesses that you're going to get copies of these PowerPoints. So Anne and Suki are going to make sure you have them. Um, but 8, 9, 10, 11 are all just about what are the essential services that can operate. You can see if you fall within those. Um, and so I'm not going to go through those. But they do list them all. There's a lot of them, construction, um, uh, landscape, uh, food service industries, all those kind. Um, also, there's uh, we get into the government as well in PowerPoint 14. It talks about government. So there's quite a few um, that are available and able to work. But again, they still have to follow best practices. They still have to work through um, several items uh, to, to be functioning. Okay, and some of these, and don't worry if um, Suki's trying to go through these slides as fast as she can push them because we had a little technical difficulty this morning, but um, you will get copies of them all, but I see they're delayed on the program screen, so I'm going to keep going through the points, and then she'll try to catch up on the PowerPoints, but you will have all of them. All right, on PowerPoint 15, other considerations. Well, provide employees a travel letter. So sometimes we're doing these travel letters. Many of our companies operate in this state and multiple states. So what happens is um, they are needing a form. First of all, it educates your employee with the travel memo, and it educates them to know that they are allowed to work. And then if someone stops them and asks them, then they can show that letter to show what they're doing and why they're out. Now, our Governor Ducey did a great job by indicating that we do not have to carry, if you're an essential service worker, which legal firms and accounting firms are as well, do not have to carry travel documents to prove to the police or others. However, we found it's always better to carry those items. It helps out uh, for people to have them. It also educates your employees that they are allowed to work and do things. Um, so keep, keep that in mind. Um, so we've got them in Arizona. We also have them for most of the states in the country, although the executive orders by governors change by day. But a lot of companies operate multi-state, so it's important. Part of the governor's orders in Arizona was to maximize teleworking if possible. So if you can do teleworking, we like to see a teleworking uh, agreement or a policy. I wouldn't just have everybody randomly working remotely. It's a temporary situation. Your policy should indicate that. It should remind people that employees are at will. 
and remind them that um, if you want to be signed an agreement, you're covering things like safety of the work area where they're working, wage and hour issues, um, many things. So um, keep that in mind um, when you're trying to let people work remotely. Some jobs will work for it, some jobs won't. And again, um, as item 4 says on PowerPoint 15, continue to emphasize best practices for limiting transmission and keeping up the immune system. That's really critical is that immune system. So keep that, um, you know, keep that in mind. And I like to, again, I like to do the training and, and document it with safety toolbox toxins for office people and field differently for each industry. So keep that in mind. All right, now what happened with the Family First Coronavirus Response Act, FFCR? Well, on March 14, 2020, um, the Congress passed and the president signed this FFCRA. And PowerPoint 17 gives you some of the details of what are the key provisions. The law applies to companies that have fewer than 500 employees in the government. Oh, so one employee to 499, um, the law applies to. And the government. It became effective April 1st. So if you went back and looked at the law, it says April 2nd. That's not it. They did it a day early because Department of Labor was issuing the regulations on it. So April 1st and expires December 31st, 2020. The two key provisions in the act that we're going to talk about that's very important for businesses today to know is there's two types of emergency leaves that are added to whatever you have already. So the emergency paid sick leave act, EPSLA as we call it, and the emergency family and medical leave expansion act, FAMILIA, those two, and that's how we refer to them to keep it separate from your real policies that you may have. Um, and don't confuse these two as they're very different. They overlap, and they have different qualifying reasons, and you're going to keep track of it separately. So EPSLA and FAMILIA, and they are going to go away on December 31st. All right, let's, let's go to the next one on the key points. Let's start with um, the first one. So oh, one other thing, yeah, on the PowerPoint 18, it just tells you some other things that happened in the FFCRA Act, the Family First Coronavirus Act, um, free coronavirus testing for everyone, Enhanced unemployment benefits if the loss of unemployment is related to COVID, that accounts for sole proprietors and independent contractors. Additional funds for Medicaid and nutritional programs, protection of healthcare workers, and allows an OSHA respiratory device to be used for healthcare workers. Um, now, let's talk about um, the unemployment benefits for a moment. So, the next one talks about the executive order, and unemployment benefits are going to be provided. The employee meets existing requirements and the earnings and residency. So they have to meet all of those. And if their um, company has permanently or temporarily ceased their operations or they've been part of a, a layoff um, and they're not able to work uh, because they are required to be quarantined. So maybe they're laid off, maybe they're furloughed. Those are all going to qualify for the new unemployment, which has an increased amount and extends the time and has different rules. And it will not apply to your company's experience rating. So keep that in mind under this FFCRA. So the response you give to unemployment is important. The response you give will say something like um, person, you know, uh, you know, under the uh, FFCRA Act, this should not be um, uh, allocated to my company's um, unemployment experience rating, but this was a, you know, person was um, let go or the hours were reduced based on the COVID-19. And that should be your response on those. Um, some of them are on quarantine, so that may be another reason why um, they may collect under the Act, because they were exposed and they had to stay at home for two weeks, and that's another reason that they're allowed to collect the unemployment. Um, so risk of exposure. The one-week waiting period is waived, so on PowerPoint 20 it talks a little bit about those terms and confirms for you that you're, you, the, the, usually we have a seven-day time period by which um, the employee can't get unemployment, that's been waived. So if you have to send someone home for seven or 14 days under the act um, because of an exposure or positive test, that's waived. But the requirement and the requirement that the person seek work and be able to work is now waived. That's an unusual provision there on PowerPoint 3 or item 3 on PowerPoint 20 because usually you have to do those you know, lists every week of where you've applied for work and all that. They're not even having people do that at this point in time. Um, the other thing is, uh, it applies to back to March 11th, 2020. So keep that in mind. Okay, now we're going to get into the next PowerPoint of F Familia, the Family Medical Leave um, Emergency Act. So some of you today are going to go, wait a minute, I'm under 50 employees. Why do I have to deal with that law? 
Um, so this was just a way for Congress to quickly be able to grab a law that had already a body of rules and cases and things that they could use and say, okay, this is what will we'll apply to everybody else. So now remember, this is going to apply. There's two provisions we're going to talk about. It's the familiar one, the, the emergency family medical leave, that applies from one employee to 499. Doesn't apply to people 500 employees or more. Just one to 499. Then we'll talk about that emergency paid sick leave one. So what does this do? It requires employees to have been employed 30 days immediately before the date of leave or 30 days after March 2nd, if laid off and rehired. Requires 12 weeks of FMLA leave, but for only one reason. So be careful for some of the information that got circulated that was just wrong. It was based on the earlier bill. What got enacted was one reason only for this particular provision, and that's nothing to do with being sick or ill or taking care of anybody. Nothing to do with any of that. Um, it's only to do with the need to care for a child um, whose school or place of care is closed or the care provider is not available due to public health emergency. So that's the sole reason, child care. Uh, for someone 17 and under. It gets, and it's 12 weeks. The first two weeks are unpaid. The next 10 weeks are paid at two thirds of the person's regular pay with the maximum recovery under the payroll tax credit of $200 per day with an aggregate cap to $10,000. So what does that mean? We have 12 weeks, two weeks unpaid, but again, the, pay, the emergency paid sick leave might cover that. We'll talk about that in a minute. And it can run concurrently, so the first two weeks could be under the emergency paid sick leave. The next 10 are two-thirds of the regular pay to take care of kids. And what your recovery is as a company is a maximum payroll tax credit of 200 per day with the aggregate cap at $10,000. Now, one other thing. We're going to talk about how you calculate that and how you get your recovery. But keep those numbers in mind. We're working on a grid that we'll send out to everybody shortly. But companies with fewer than 50 workers, so remember, those of you with 50 employees or more are used to dealing with FMLA. So it usually applied every company, 50 employers or more, and they had all kinds of specific requirements. The normal FMLA stays in effect. This is just an emergency provision. It applies to everybody, but if you have under 50 employees, there is a way to exempt from the pay requirement if it would jeopardize the viability of the business. And there's a standard for that you can use, and we'll talk about that, but that may be helpful if it's if it's too much to handle for your business. All right, now we'll keep going on. What is that qualifying reason on PowerPoint 22? We lay that out. So, and, and by the way, certain healthcare providers and first responders are excluded from the Family Medical Leave Act because they're needed and being essential service providers for the moment. They still could qualify in a regular FMLA leave if there's more than 50 employees, um, but that would be part of it. So the leave could be used for a qualified need relating to a public health emergency, which means that it's up to this page. The employee is unable to work or telework. Remember, they are not be able to work or telework due to the need to leave, for leave to care for a son or daughter under 18 years of age if the school has been closed or their place of care has been closed. So, or there's no child care provider available due to the public health emergency of the pandemic. Employee using the leave must provide certification that there's no other person taking care of the child. Leave is available under DOL regs only if the person is actually needed to and is actually providing care. So we're just warning you that you should have a temporary policy. That's what I've been doing with companies right now. It's temporary policy and certifications because right now the Department of Labor is one set of regulations and auditors that may come back, as well as the IRS who came out with some different rules about this leave and was very skeptical of people staying home with the 15 to 17 year old range of ages. So you're going to have to have employees certified and they have to understand that they are doing it honestly and accurately and they're not engaging in fraud in the system because they, if it's just like unemployment, if you engage in fraud and you receive unemployment monies, obviously the government can come back and make people pay it back. So it really does have to be a real need. Okay, what about reinstatement? Is it required after a uh, in this one. So we're used to the regular Family Medical Leave Act that says that you have to guarantee the position and reinstate them. It's a little bit different and it's defined on the next PowerPoint 23. It says you have to, under this particular rule only, return the employee to the same or equivalent position in 12 weeks, except that this apply to companies with fewer than 25 employees. If the position no longer exists due to economic changes, the company must make reasonable efforts there to restore the employee to the same or equivalent position. If no position is immediately available, 
The company must attempt to contact the employee and reinstate the person if a position becomes available within a one-year period, beginning on the earlier of the date on which the qualified need relating to the public health emergency condition concludes, or the date that is 12 weeks after the date the employee's leave started. So it's another thing to keep track of. Okay, that's the uh, familiar. Now we're going to move on the next PowerPoint to paid sick leave. So those are the basics on the emergency family medical leave for one to 499 employees. Now we're going to choose, so you know you have some exceptions for if you're under 50, there's a small business exemption to argue the standards on to not have that one apply. And if you have under 25 employees, you may have some other opportunities there for that one. Now the Emergency Paid Sick Leave Act, EPSLA, again, temporary, remember, don't confuse it, this goes away December 31st, but the same thing, you have to give, um, it applies to under 500 employees, you have to provide 80 hours of paid sick leave prorated for part-time to be used for a number of reasons. So remember the one we just went through was specific to childcare and schools closing for the emergency family medical. That's it for that particularly particular emergency leave. This one's different. It has a bunch of categories, which is also part of the policy and the certification to have employees sign off on. So a couple of things. It could be used because the employee is subject to a, a federal, state, or local quarantine or isolation order. They're shut down. They're not an essential service, for example, like our restaurants, a lot of those. Um, the employee has been advised by a health care provider to self-quarantine. Could be a travel reason, someone in their family. Maybe they have symptoms, and so the health care provider says you need to self-isolate for 14 days. If the employee is experiencing symptoms of COVID-19, that's item number three. That's another reason they can qualify for the Paid Sick Leave Act. If the employee is caring for an individual who is subject to orders one or two, that's another reason that qualifies. Now, number five is similar to what we saw in the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act. If it's to care for a child or because a school is closed or childcare unavailable due to COVID. So number five is similar to the one in the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act. And we're going to talk about what that means on a different basis as well. But keep in mind, you do have that exemption under 50 for only this provision only, you have under 50 employees. Okay, now let's go to the next one and we'll talk about um, what the leave means. So on PowerPoint 25, it defines a little bit more on um, what the Paid Sick Leave Act, um, what, what the amounts are. And this becomes important on your grid when you're keeping track and accounting and payroll. So this leave, these two leaves, are in addition to whatever leave you already provide. So if you already have a PTO plan, vacation, or sick, um, this is in addition to that. So those are separate. So let's just talk about the EPSLA for a minute. So because of those qualifying reasons that they've signed your application, your certification on, you get paid differently under the uh, payroll um, leave, the tax credit. So if the leave for EPSLA relates to the employee's own diagnosis or exposure to COVID, you would pay them for those two weeks at the regular rate of pay, the regular rate they get, but what you get to recover as a company, there's a cap per day and an aggregate for that one employee, $511 per day and 5,110 in the aggregate. So, that means that's what you're going to apply for. You're going to have credit on your taxes when you turn them in, and you have to keep track. Do you want to segregate all this information carefully because you're going to have to justify it later for not submitting taxes? Um, and it's for their own diagnosis or exposure. Now, there's another category. The one about, under EPSLA, the one about child care, which has nothing to do with anyone being ill. If their kids' schools closed, there's no child care, now they get two weeks of EPSLA. So out of that 12-week FMLA we talked about, those first two weeks were unpaid. This is where the EPSLA comes in to pay those first two weeks. But it's paid differently. So leave is paid at two-thirds the employee's regular rate of pay, and the reimbursement to the company for the payroll tax credit is 200 a day and 2000 in the aggregate. So that's how those two weeks are treated, okay? And remember, healthcare and first responders can be excluded from those. From those. Okay, now, who pays for the sick time or leave time? That's what we're going to talk about next PowerPoint. On that, it's covered employers. Again, this only applies to one employee to 500. 
who pay the cost, so actually pay them, they get some tax credits subject to certain cap. The employers can recover 100% of the qualified emergency uh, FEMLA and the emergency paid sick leave. But there were three different categories we just went over with you, so make sure you pay attention to which one apply and per day. So the delta between a regular rate of pay and the amount it's going to pay, whether it's 511 a day for reimbursement or 200 pay for taking care of the kids and school out, you, you're that's the part you can potentially recover. The law requires you to give certain notices, and those posters were out, and we have them on our website in English and Spanish, so you do have to have them. And people with 500 or more employees are not covered by this law, but have to comply with other existing laws, like the regular FMI law, which, which means that you get to have an automatic 12-week uh, guaranteed job when you get back, the larger they are. All right. Now, the next half we talked about is the paid sick leave or FMLA available if company or if employees don't work due to business closure. So this is an important point. Um, leave is available if the employee is unable to work or is allowed to telework, unable to work or unable to telework, I should say. The employee is unable to telework if the employer allows telework and has telework available, but there may be extenuating circumstances. Maybe they're, they're sick, someone's sick, they can't. It can't work. But this leave, these two paid leaves that they put together by the government are available only if the company otherwise has work available and the employee cannot work for a covered reason. So what does that mean? So if you're laying off an employee, they don't get either of these two leaves. If you have furloughed an employee, meaning you're telling the employee, look, we're going to keep you as an employee of the company. We are just not scheduling you to work for now. And we have to wait until there's actual work and we see how this shapes out. We can't promise you work. We hope this all turns around, where there's no guarantee, you're still an at-will employee. But during this time on a furlough, you may still get some benefits if you pay your share, whatever the company's arrangement is. But we just want to keep you out there to say we're trying to get to the point where we can call you back. And um, the furlough means they can collect unemployment though while they wait. So the layoff would mean they don't they have to go look for a new job and start over. Uh, furlough means you're trying to say, hey, if it gets better and faster, we want you to stay back to work. And but you can collect unemployment in the meantime, but they cannot collect these two rules: the emergency paid sick leave or emergency FEMLA. And of course, you can't retaliate against someone using the leave. All right, now here's a point on the next uh, PowerPoint we wanted to emphasize because it got a little confusing on intermittent. So what we did was break that out on PowerPoint 28 to help you understand what is the intermittent leave and how does that work in a circumstance. So usually. Uh, let me, I don't know which way the easiest way to say it is, but intermittent leave is permitted under the family medical leave emergency if agreed upon by the employee and employer. So you have to have an agreement about it. It's permitted under the family medical leave, which is only for taking care of kids, and under the EPSLA qualifying condition for taking care of kids if schools closed for child care. So it's permitted for other leaves only if the employee is teleworking. So here's the issue with the concepts here on these intermittent leaves. For the emergency family medical leave, that is not anything to do with flattening the curve. It's just taking care of kids because schools are closed and child care. So think of it in concept like that. So it makes sense intermittent leave would apply, but it's not necessarily about keeping people out of the workforce. It's not to minimize the spread. It's just to take care of the kids. So that's why intermittent leave is allowed. So, so spouses are working out arrangements where two of them are working in the office or with their company Tuesday and Thursday. The other one does Monday and Wednesday. They get some of their child care on Friday. And they're spreading out this intermittent leave and the pay reductions or amounts through the end of the cycle. And that's how they're breaking it up. And you as an employer can talk about that with them and try to work that out if you can, if they're willing to do that. The emergency paid sick leave, because again, it's not about someone's own health conditions. You can only use it for the child care for intermittent leave. But the other parts of the emergency paid sick leave were you're sick, you're supposed to be out of work or you've been exposed. The whole point is flattening the curve. You cannot give them intermittent leave for those reasons. They must stay at home and self-isolate and not leave at all because that was the whole purpose of the paid leave. So they cannot go out of the house and they really are to stay at the home um, and those kind of things. So that makes sense when you think about it that way. Okay, now we get into the nitty gritty on the next PowerPoint on what do you got to keep to get this tax credit? So now you've gone through, here's how it applies. You've made your checklist. Now it's what do you need to get from people so that you can actually get reimbursed for some of these monies 
that you're having to give people. So PowerPoint 29 gives you that summary of what are the documents to maintain for tax credit when providing leave. The IRS requires a statement from the employee containing the employee's name, the dates on which leave is requested, the COVID-19 qualifying reasons for the leave and supporting written document, a statement that the employee is unable to work or telework because of the COVID-19 qualifying reason, and if the leave is to quarantine under government order, the name of the government entity issuing the order, if it's to self-isolate under order of a health care provider, the health care provider's name, and if it's to care for a child whose school is closed, the name of the children, the name of the school is closed, and that no other suitable person is available to care for the child, and if the child is older than 14 and care is being provided in daylight hours, a statement that special circumstances exist requiring the employee to provide care for those children 15 to 17. So this is why you need a certification application as well as um, the uh, policy. So, you know, keep that in mind. And again, they're temporary, so I would not change the handbook because these are going to go away December 31st. Okay. So now let's talk about the next PowerPoint 30 about the small business exemption under the Families First Coronavirus Act. So there is this exemption that may apply for a lot of you in business today that have fewer than 50 employees and are part of the heart and soul of America, quite frankly, and this has really become a difficult time in keeping these businesses going um, and showing support for one another, as Anna was saying earlier, to help each other learn things, get by, and get back to the day when things get a little more normal, when we get a vaccine, more than likely. Um, a year away, by the way, um, or more. So let's talk about the small business exemption. So businesses with fewer than 50 employees may be exempt from the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act, that one for child care, and from only that provision on the paid sick leave that deals with caring for children. That's it. The other part of the paid sick leave applies. Doesn't change. That's always going to be there if you have one employer or more to four nine point. The small business is not exempt from those remaining provisions of the EPSLA. So you get to determine your own eligibility, but DOL likely will audit it. And the next PowerPoint on PowerPoint 31 gives you the three standards to look at to justify that your company um, could not be viable if you tried to implement those provisions. So under PowerPoint 31, it's for A, B, and C. The provision of the paid sick leave or expanded family medical leave act would result in the small business's expenses and financial obligations exceeding available business revenue and cause the small business to cease operating at a minimal capacity. Or the absence of these employees would entail a substantial risk to the financial health or operational capabilities of the small business, mainly because they may need their skills or knowledge or experience or they have um, responsibilities that would have to be done or there's not enough sufficient other workers who are able, willing, and qualified to do the work. So the next PowerPoint 32 talks about why do you document that? So what companies should do is make a written record of how they determined that you should be exempt and keep all the supporting records because you will get audited on this more than likely. And some of the records we list on that PowerPoint show financial statements, employee information, including job duties, and why losing that person for up to 12 weeks would entail a substantial risk to the company's health or operations. Any contracts or job orders and similar documents that identify the work to be performed and why there would be insufficient employees to complete the work if leave was provided or other documents showing the company's financial situation and why it would be jeopardized if you had to provide 12 weeks of leave and keep the position open. So those are some of the items that for those that are under 50 employees, you can write up. You might have someone check it for you, your legal counsel um, or your accountant. Um, we've been writing kind of just these basic statements to put in the file and attach whatever we can when companies are letting the employees know that the provision for the Family Medical Leave Act for child care is not available. And that's the only one this is for. Keep that in mind. I keep saying it so not get everybody confused. Okay. Now, let's talk about how do you get reimbursed. That's on PowerPoint 33. And we talk about the Family First Coronavirus Act tax credits. So now we're going to move to how do you get paid? So covered employers providing leave, both in either of those two emergency leaves, the Family Medical Leave Act or the EPSLA, 
are entitled to a 100% refundable tax credit up to those caps that we talked about, which means the company could pay more in wages than is recoverable if the employee's regular rate of pay is higher than the caps for the EPSLA or the emergency family medical leave. You also get to include, though, portions of health care premiums and the employer's share of Medicare tax on wages paid under EPSLA or the Emergency Family Medical Leave Act. So that's helpful. So the next PowerPoint on 34 reviews those caps again. So you can get this right because you're going to have this come up very quickly now. So the wage tax credit limits are 511 per day or maximum of 5,110 for EPSLA, the emergency paid sick leave, used for the employee's own COVID-19 health or quarantine. Item two talks about wage tax credit limited to 200 a day or $2,000 total if the emergency paid sick leave is used to care for another person who has been quarantined or a child whose school or place of care is closed. Then we have the emergency family medical leave on that last item on this bullet point, on this PowerPoint. It says the wage tax credit under emergency family medical leave is limited to 200 per day for a total of $10,000. So that's why we're working on a flowchart and grid to help you with that. But that's your limits. All right, so now how do we get them? Well, how do we credit that? So PowerPoint 35 is called the tax credit recovery of those amounts. So there's your limits. Now we're going to move to the getting it back. Okay, so the credit is allowed against the company's portion of the Social Security taxes of 6.2% that you normally turn in. If the credit exceeds the Social Security tax, it's going to be treated like an overpayment of taxes. So the company may retain the amounts from the withheld federal income taxes the and the employee's share of Social Security and Medicare taxes and the employer's share of Social Security and Medicare taxes even though at the end of the day, the credit is against social security tax obligations. To the extent necessary to cover whatever you're paying for the qualifying paid leave under emergency paid sick leave or the emergency family medical leave. Act. So those are the reasons, that's the amount, that's how you get the recovery. It's a little bit scary. I know we all think we'll go to jail if we don't turn in our taxes that we've withheld from the employee's paycheck and what we owe as a company. So it's a little bit scary to do something different that you've never done in the history of your business or your personal life, but in this one circumstance, you get to be your own banker and keep track of all the records properly, and we'll give you an example. So on PowerPoint 36, the next one is a tax credit calculation example, so showing you how you can do it. Now again, remember our disclaimer at the beginning, you know, and talk with your accountant or your, and or your lawyer to make sure that you're comfortable and that you're claiming it correctly, but we're trying to give you concrete examples today to help you. But the IRS provided these following two examples. The first one is, let's say we have an, an eligible company, so you've got to be eligible first. And that company, when they went to pay and submit, they, they added up their monies, and they paid $5,000 in sick leave, and is otherwise supposed to have paid another 8000 in payroll taxes for this, this particular time period. So they did their little chart, 5,000 in sick leave, and then they did their 8,000 in, um, in, in payroll taxes. So how does that work? Well, they can, the taxes, and including the taxes withheld from all the employees paycheck. So the employer gets to use up to $5,000 in that sick leave now of the 8,000 in taxes it's supposed to deposit to make those leave payments. So what amount do we turn in? 8,000 minus 5,000 is 3,000. So you would turn in 3000 instead of your normal eight. So you do need to keep very good records on this. Now, how about the opposite way? What if you owe more in sick leave than what you were able to, you were going to deposit in taxes to the government? If an eligible employer paid $10,000 in sick leave and was required to deposit 8000 in taxes, the employer obviously could use the entire 8000 in taxes to help cover that qualified leave payment. And then you're allowed to file a request for an accelerated credit for the remaining $2,000. Kind of sounds weird, doesn't it? So the next PowerPoint 37 tells you how do you get that though. So you file this accelerated credit, how does that work? And how do you report these items? Well, the companies claim the tax credit on the Form 941, and the IRS has stated that the 941 will contain additional instructions that you should follow. Again, work with your counsel and your accounting accountant. Your account will be able to help you figure all that out. Give them a little time. They're working through things as quick as they can with everything. 
The companies who have reduced their federal employment tax deposits for the wages they paid out under those two leaves only, um, they still have paid, have paid out more leave than what they owe the government for taxes. They also can use Form 7200 if an advanced payment of employer credits due to COVID. So keep that in mind. And if you use a third party payer, um, you know, you need to work with them. If it's the company, um, you'll have to report and pay it. There's going to be certain rules for claiming and reporting those credits. Um, it'll depend on the type of third party payer you're using. So keep that in mind too. You also need to remember if you're going to be applying for the different, under the CARES Act, you know, we're talking about the Families First Coronavirus Act. We're talking about the payroll tax credit that is not the same as the payroll protection program. So remember that the tax credit for payroll is different than the loan that everybody's talking about in the CARES Act. And sometimes there's a restriction and if you use one, you can't use the other, or it'll, it'll affect your ability to get a forgiveness of the loan to that amount if you're already taking the tax credit on it. So just be aware of that and um, get help on that. Also, keeping track of the records for your payroll provider or yourself, I would put in the paychecks. Um, you know, when, I mean, when the reason that people take leave, I would change your payroll register to say DV child care, so you know when it qualifies for emergency medical leave or emergency paid leave under child care, that's paid one way. I would change your coding to CV self for coronavirus for self, meaning I had an issue for exposure or positive, so that's a different pay under paid sick leave, and that doesn't count for the emergency family medical leave. And I would do CV other in your payroll system for CV other, meaning taking care of someone with COVID-19. So that way you can run these reports, know who gets your paid sick leave, know what you owe for taxes and figure it out. And you can always justify it when there's an audit. All right. Now, you know how to do all the payroll tax credit. You've got that down. You know now about the two different emergency leaves, the emergency FEMLA, the emergency sick leave. Those go away December 31st. Now we're going to talk about and switch to the payroll protection program that a lot of you are thinking about. Those loans, what do they mean? Okay. So, the um, paycheck program, oh, first of all, unemployment, I forgot we worked that in. We added that first. Uh, we had a lot of people ask about unemployment, I forgot, and Heidi and I uh, put these in last night. Let's talk about that for a minute. So, the Federal Pandemic Unemployment Compensation Program, as it's called, um, it provides more money for unemployment. So, we're having a problem where some employees don't want to come back to work, right? They're getting an extra $600 per week. In addition to the regular state benefit, and Arizona's was one of the lowest, it was only 122 to 240 a week for unemployment through the end of July. So through the end of July, it's an extra 600 a week. So people are not as active to look if that if they're getting 840 a week. They've been staying at home and not looking in the workforce. So you'll see it pick up when that starts running out. Um, and the 600 extra is regardless of how much other unemployment the person is entitled to receive. So it's 600 plus whatever they get. Um, and they can get a partial unemployment benefit if hours are significantly reduced. They still may be eligible for the additional 600. But some companies we know we've helped them reduce hours, rotate their hours, stagger shifts, work over seven days, try to minimize physical distancing in the workplace. Some of our manufacturing plants have gone down to working seven days a week, but they changed it to two eight hour shifts instead of one eight hour shift for five days when everybody worked at the same time. So that they can get more people employed, they can meet their physical distancing rules and work. And unemployment eligibility, this is very, very unique, has been extended to sole proprietors and independent contractors and gig workers who generally would be independent and not qualified for unemployment. So that helps capture a lot of people in the workplace. All right, and then if you want to go to the next PowerPoint, um, then we'll talk a little bit more on the next one. Sorry, Suki's having to do all the PowerPoints, so I apologize. We added these at the end. We wanted to get these in here. So it takes a minute on the Microsoft Windows version for the Teams. And then we'll talk about the payroll protection program. Now, okay, now. So the total amount, PowerPoint 39 starts with it. Um, the payroll protection program is up to $10 million max for a company. It's applying for businesses or applies to businesses under 500 employees. And 
the larger business is over 500 based on the SIC code. The loan amount is based on your 2019 payroll, but when you're calculating it, you don't count any income or salaries over $100,000 per employee. So it's your calculation on 2019, taking off your anyone that made over 100,000. It can include your group health premiums and other similar costs. You'll have a total max to apply for of 10 million. It's limited, first come, first served. And the bank, there have been some bank issues in processing and rejecting companies from applying and all kinds of things like that. Um, as you knew from the bank, some were ready to go uh, last Friday, a week ago. And then um, they got slowed down a little bit because of, uh, the government was concerned about know your customer and they wanted to have people who they could have the banks verifying monies and financial records. The banks were like, wait a minute, that's not our job to verify individual companies and what's in their account. We don't want to be caught up with frauds, they have to slow down a little bit and come up with some systems. Um, but please keep in mind, um, and you'll hear more about this next Friday's program, a lot more detail about uh, the, what you can use it for, um, what to be cautious about, um, but you do have to be careful in that certification. There is an investigation that will happen. Um, they will come back and say so you don't want to sign applications or submit things that you could be um, you know, held as fraud or dishonest. So be very careful about that. The banks have gotten a little nervous about that. But people are getting funded. Smaller bankers have now started funding. Um, the bigger banking is going in soon and loans are going through. So it is a, a program that may work for you. So the next PowerPoint talks about what are those forgiveness requirements and if I apply for it, how does that work? So if you get a loan and you get those funds, the day you get your funds, you are having eight weeks to get everything followed through with. You have to use 75% of the loan amount for payroll costs. The other 25% must be used, may be used for other eligible expenses like rent, utilities, and mortgage interest. If the total number of full-time equivalent employees is reduced in the eight weeks following the loan origination, the loan forgiveness amount will be reduced pursuant to a formula. You're supposed to keep uh, a large percentage of your workers by the end of the eight weeks, 75% of it, I believe, the number. And you just have to make sure that you're using, you're not lowering your pay more than 25% for the people remaining. There's a certain percentage of them on the payroll at the end of the eight weeks, and you can only use it for certain uh, items. Uh, so keep that in mind because that is going to determine your loan forgiveness amount. If you received more than that and you couldn't justify those legitimate numbers, um, then you're going to pay interest at 1% per annum with a two-year maturity and pay it back to the government. So that's why you want to segregate these monies in a separate account, and you want to keep track in that way. Um, so get the monies, segregate, justify it, um, be transparent, be ready for the audit. And the next PowerPoint talks about what are the kind of things that you could be audited for and how is that going to look so you can figure that out. So PowerPoint 41 goes through the kind of things they will target. Applicants must be truthful in applying for a payroll paycheck protection loan. Um, broad authority to pursue civil and criminal remedies. You have to be aware that the SIGBR GPR audits loans. The other benefits they also are going to be auditing, disaster recovery loan, that $10,000 one, the emergency loan, and the payroll tax credits that we talked about for the other two emergency provisions. There are also affiliation rules if you have multiple companies. So there may be size issues, even if based on correct SIC codes, when you have to combine all those multiple companies together. Now, for a quick minute, there's just a couple PowerPoints we're going to go through on the CARES Act assistance to large employers, 500 or over. Um, and we're not going to do a lot on that, but there is uh, just three PowerPoints on that real quick, just so you know what's happening with them. Um, they can use the loans uh, some contain an alternative size standard that may allow eligibility for if you have more than 500 employees. If you make 15 million or less, the average net income after federal income taxes for the past two full years was 5 million or less, excluding carryover losses. The economic injury disaster loans, the IDL is what you're going to call the IDL um, for emergency use. There's up to 2 million loan with an up to $10,000 emergency grant. Uh, it's also based on your SBA standards, and most types of construction businesses qualify, um, and others, if they have 16.5 million or less, surprisingly. So people didn't realize that. But watch your affiliation rules. The employee retention credit, it's called ERC, it's fully refundable 
federal tax credit for businesses, regardless of size, if the operations were suspended by the government order, or if gross receipts for a calendar year, a calendar quarter in 2020, are less than 50% of those for the same quarter in 2019, and that's it's on PowerPoint 43. And the credit is 50% of qualified wages between March 12, 2020, and January 1, 2021. So that means you can get up to 10,000 per employee and a maximum credit um, for 10,000 wages per employee and 5,000 credit for employee. If you have over 100 employees, only wages paid to employees who are not currently working count. And then the last PowerPoint on this point is just um, U.S. Treasury Bank loans for businesses with 500 to 10,000 for these stabilization fund loans, 2% rate of interest, six months of deferred payments, and some things of that nature. So we can't be in bankers. All right, now we'll go to the next PowerPoint on this investigation under the CARES Act, because I want you to understand that because everyone thought this was free money, and PowerPoint 45 starts telling you about um, it's not necessarily free, right? It, it is helpful to stem the tide, but we do have a special inspector general for pandemic recovery, the SIGPR, S-I-G-P-R, and they monitor fraud and abuse, and they have five years that they'll be in business to pursue it. So you've got to think of a lot of people employed will conduct, supervise, and coordinate audits. You're going to look at loan, loan guarantee, everything related to this economic stabilization fund under the CARES Act. Companies can be subject to depositions, subpoena, arrest warrants, uh, anything like that. So what can you do? Well, the next pair of points tell you a little bit about the steps that you want to think about before taking these loans. Businesses utilizing the CARE Act should ensure applications or representations to the government are accurate, avoid fraud or integrity allegations, don't go too close to the line on this, it'll cause you issues, implement control measures to track and document the use of dispersed funds, Make sure the company has an audit tracking feature to demonstrate to the government if there's an audit, you can do a complete tracing of the monies and it's been in place all the way through. Again, establish a separate account, as I mentioned, segregate those monies and track everything in that account from those loans. Item four on PowerPoint 47 talks about comply with restrictions and conditions. There's gonna be things you'll sign when you get the monies and under the regulations that you may not have realized are in there. A lot of people were applying for this and didn't realize that um, they had an affiliation problem, and they start applying, not realizing it's an issue. Update your business code of ethics policies and adopt procedures to obtain compliance. Develop internal accounting controls and procedures for internal auditing. Make sure you've got this under control. Be thoughtful and responsive to any audit conducted by the SIGPR. Don't be dilatory. Don't, don't be uncooperative. Don't be inaccurate. Because once you do that, you can get in trouble. And have counsel help you with any SIGPR audit because of the potential civil and criminal. Okay, now... Let's talk, go back to the workplace, workplace a little bit. So PowerPoint 48 talks about recommendations to limit transmission of the virus. Obviously practice physical distancing. They started to change the word from social because we want to be social. They said social distancing. We're like, no, nah, we want to be social like we're doing today. Um, but physical distancing for sure. Six feet or more, six to 10 is nice. Wear a cloth mask or face covering when outside your home. That's now the new the new uh, recommendation. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth. Wash your hands frequently. Get sanitizers. We've had some of our great businesses in Arizona switch their distilleries over to making sanitizers, so it's available. Just look online. Support our Arizona businesses. Cover your cough, sneeze with a tissue. Throw it away or cover a sneeze into your elbow. We know the number one way that you transmit this is by sneezing and coughing, and that viral load in the air in more dense areas, like you see in some areas or in parks or um, locations where there's a lot of people, that's what causes a lot of those transmissions. That's the primary way. So in more dense cities, we're seeing more issues with that because people are around each other. Where you spread out more, it's less of an issue because people have you know enough air for it to dissipate after a few hours. You are supposed to clean and disinfect frequently high-touch areas. Um, clean your cell phone daily. My big reminder, we, we know this in the restaurant industry and representing restaurants, we always talk about this to employees, is that your cell phone it's 10 times dirtier than a public toilet, so please clean it regularly. It keeps that bacteria. Um, and then going on with some more recommendations, stay home if you're sick, except to get medical care. If a child is sick, keep them home. Stay home from unnecessary shopping and social events. We know we don't want to have anyone with 10 or more people at social gatherings. Limit any non-essential travel. 
Schedule meetings via telephone conference or web conference. Um, we have had some issues with internet web conferences. We have a few difficulties this morning, but it is because everybody's using them. And so sometimes there's bandwidth issues. Sometimes there's just a lot of Macs on the system. Um, so it does happen. Consider work from home or telecommuting arrangements if possible to help limit in-person contact. And really, item 14 here, take care of your health. It's really important right now to stay hydrated, keep your immune system strong, um, sleep, good eating habits, and appropriate vitamins. So they are saying that your immune system really does impact how this COVID-19 um, uh, actually is less symptoms, very few symptoms, not as severe. It's really a lot in that area. Okay, next PowerPoint talks about additional steps. How can we think about each of our workplaces? You know, now you have to do kind of your job hazard analysis and figure out what works. Do you have a shared water receptacle in your company? Um, replace it with single-use bottles or have people use bottles. Provide, um, we've been using recycled paper, I know, in our office where we have everybody carry, you know, tearing papers in half that were recycled from the copier. And then when you open doors or touch a bathroom door or go through a door, you're using the piece of paper and then throw it away. So you're really not touching anything. Because gloves, you continue to pass the, the germ, right? You use a piece of paper, you don't. So you throw it away. Um, increase regular cleaning schedules. If there's a high traffic time of the day, prop the doors open so people aren't touching those handles. Don't share if you can avoid, if you can. Uh, avoid sharing phones, computer keyboards, stuff like that. And again, using those scrap pieces of paper is a good way to try to minimize it. Um, and the next page just talks about don't use your food dispensers. A lot of people have shut down their break rooms and their uh, cafeteria areas or eating areas. Um, but if you go to a, a place where there's something being used that is a high touch dispenser, I wouldn't do that. And again, this is going to go on for the next year. We, you know, vaccines a year away. So as restaurants open back up, they're going to do their very best to minimize items as well. Um, but you need to watch out for shared food dispensers. If a person has to travel, you can carry newspapers or papers from your recycle bin and put them in the bottom of the bin going through TSA to protect belongings and then throw them away. One of my biggest gripes, I'm an OSHA lawyer uh, and known for that nationally, and one of my biggest gripes for years has been at the TSA, there's no cleaning process for those bins, for all the, the conveyor belt. They're just like a germ magnet everywhere. And then when they make you take your shoes off on the carpet, they weren't cleaning them. So it was really, um, uh, you know, I think, I hope that changes um, at the airport start gearing back up because that's been a concern that I've noted for a while. But carrying papers is a good way to just kind of protect your gear when you're putting your coats, your purses, all these items onto that conveyor belt or in those bins, and they're so dirty and germ-oriented. Um, so keep that in mind. And people coming back from high-risk companies, uh, countries, you can make um, actually, uh, like for, we had a, for a while there from Italy, right? Travel three company countries that were noted. Uh, in our own country, we had from Louisiana, from uh, New York, uh, there's places that are hot spots, and that's just going to change. You know, we have to just pay attention. Again, improvise, adapt, overcome. Uh, we can make different arrangements that they can't come into the office for 14 days and things of that nature. All right. Next PowerPoint just talks about physical distancing. You can use some of these to help teach your people. You should go back and train everybody and document the training, especially if you're an essential service company. The governor has made that implicit in his orders that people are supposed to be teaching all the good steps, and that's um, allowing people to continue to be smart and, fit and, and try to follow the rules. But there's some points on, on PowerPoint 52 about Staying six to ten feet away, use your neck gaiter or those those buffs. I always wear a hiking buff. I've always been doing that from the beginning. It's easy. I'm used to doing it for the outside anyway, especially at this time of the year with allergies. Not unusual to do. A lot of people are making um, interesting and fun cloth masks, whatever. What people want to have a little fun with it. Um, avoid social gatherings of ten or more, no matter what. Um, that's hard for people, I know, with all the holidays and things, but important to do. All right, the next PowerPoint talks about telecommuting. We wanted to give you some tips on this. If people can work from home, that's great. Make sure everyone understands it's on a temporary basis. Nothing's guaranteed. And I really prefer that people have a written remote working policy that sets out the company's expectations for remote work. Things that you could include in there um, on PowerPoint 53 are the work environment should be free from distraction. Employees remind them they're at will and expected to comply with company policies, practices, and procedures. And you have to think about steps to take to protect the company's confidential information. 
Um, that becomes important too for proprietary information. Other things about a telecommuting or on the next PowerPoint on other areas that you want to have a telecommuting policy or a written agreement. We've done them both ways. It just depends on your company and how formal you want to be. Um, but some you may need to with some of the employees. But other areas to keep track of are wage and hour, tracking and reporting hours work. How are you going to keep track of that? Are you going to go to timesheet? What's the schedule? You have to worry about workers' comp claims, even if people work from home. So what's the schedule you're telling them they work and how are you monitoring it? And do you have the right equipment for them to work? And are they going to take an inventory list of equipment from your office back to their homes? And are you going to do an inventory list for people to sign? And restrictions on caring for others while on the clock. Um, keep in mind, children may be at home if school's canceled. Um, how are you going to deal with that in your process? Um, and remember that your home arrangement can be terminated by the company in sole discretion. All right. What other ideas I mentioned earlier on the next page is staggered hours of work. You can do that. Some people can telecommute. It's not going to work. Um, you can consider staggering the shifts. You can have an assembly line, as I mentioned, open for different times of the day um, and shifts. Um, stores can set aside dedicated shopping hours for the high risk people over 60. We're seeing that happen or pre existing conditions or people pregnant. You can open seven days a week. So things like that are on that example. So those are some of the you know, just be creative, see what works. You can expect flexibility. We do have a lot of employees playing games. Some of them are not wanting to work. So I'm trying to say, you can't make me do that, or I won't take a cut, or I'm not going to do this. And, you know, you just have to make a business decision. Unfortunately, people are a little bit more hyper. It's been a full moon week the last few days. Um, we had a lot of issues um, earlier this week over that. We lost a lot of employees who, in their long term, had a job available, and they just kind of went over the edge. So... Attendance and sick leave, be careful with that. Um, use some judgment. You might be a little more flexible in, in how you deal with this. Uh, if you have a system of counting absences as a negative factor as points, you might suspend that for now. And, you know, you can't always give people discretionary unpaid leave. So just know that your attendance and sick leave issues, um, you know, be, be aware it might be a little bit different. You may not want people to always come in and fill out a form, um, things like that. Um, and the next page just talks about how do you deal with the COVID-19 on attendance and sick leave. Uh, if people have fever, coughing, difficulty breathing, smelling food, tasting food, or a family member has been notified, I would require in your policy, they must disclose this to you. So I would require that as part of your policy. And while an employer cannot normally require employees to undergo medical exams, there's restrictions about how you do that, the, the EOC... Equal Employment Opportunity Commission has issued guidance that allows you to ask certain questions um, and not have people in the workforce that um, that have symptoms or could expose people. So that's a lot different. Um, the next couple pages talk about OSHA. So I'm not going to do a lot on that so we can get to the scenarios with the time we have left. But um, PowerPoint's 58. There's a few, a couple of them. Just talk about basically... Um, and we can fly through those. They remind you about having best practices, doing an infectious disease, a preparedness plan. That's what we mentioned. We've been doing a lot of those. Um, looking at your job hazard analysis of things to use. And PowerPoint 60 talks about additional OSHA recommendations. Probably you're using most of those from the earlier list. The only new one that I saw on that list was additional uh, trash receptacles that are open to toss items into. I thought that was a pretty good one. Because a lot of times we forget and we have closed trash containers and you have to touch something to drop it in there. Um, having an open one is probably a better arrangement anyway. Probably a lot of people going forward just um, will be doing that. So you can ask people with symptoms to wear cloth face masks. You have a right as OSHA to do some of that. Um, and, the, and as OSHA, you know, you have a right for personal protective equipment. Um, to make people wear things like gloves, eye masks, respiratory masks, other things that they do in the construction industry, at landscape. And a hazard communication clause may apply. So make sure if you're bringing materials into the workforce uh, for chemicals, for cleaning, you have to have what's called SDS sheet, safety data sheet. So don't forget that too. Um, so those are some of the things you need. On PowerPoint 62, we went ahead and listed for you the, some, some bullet points you might put into your COVID-19 prevention, preparedness, and response plan. Um, you know, how you're protecting employees from disease and illnesses, best practices to stop the spread, 
your policy on physical distancing, policies regarding employee illness, and procedures for cleaning and disinfecting. And again, I'm a big believer on that last bullet point on PowerPoint 62 about conducting employee training and toolbox talks regarding best practices to prevent the spread. I just think you should be documenting that. The next PowerPoint talks about your OSHA 300 log. COVID-19 must be recorded on your OSHA 300 logs if it meets all the following conditions on PowerPoint 63. The case is a confirmed case of COVID-19. It's work-related as defined by OSHA regulations and it involves one or more of their general recording criteria. A lot of them are not always going to work and, and you're going to report them and they're just not going to fit that category. But if you're in the healthcare industry or first responder, it might. Um, PowerPoint 63 talks about rules for employees working from home. OSHA said they will not conduct at-home work inspections, but they do want companies uh, to make sure that there's certain duties that they're, they're making sure telecommuting employees engage in. That's why we like to have that uh, policy and written agreement filled out. And if they do have an injury at home and it's work related, then you would record it on the OSHA 300 log. So that tells you the rules on that. And as a reminder on 65, on PowerPoint 65 after the retaliation issue, we always remember with OSHA, as we always say, um, don't retaliate against people for any of these claims or making comments or protected activity related to it if they bring something up. So just keep that in mind. All right, a couple quick PowerPoints and I want to get to the scenarios from the time we have left. Um, on PowerPoint 66, 67, there's a few things related to questions employers may ask employees during a pandemic. So the EOC has put out a guidance and it talks about, um, you know, what can you say, what can't you do? First of all, companies can require employees to stay home if they have symptoms of COVID. If the employee becomes ill with symptoms of the flu, employers should also advise employees to go home. So advising workers to go home is not going to be considered a disability related action under the Americans with Disabilities Act for the purpose of this pandemic. So that's good news. That's always good. Now, the next PowerPoint on 67 says you can actually do more and even measure the temperature of employees. So you're starting to see these, ten, these uh, thermometer guns out at job sites and other places. You'll see them in the airports. So as those continue to be made, do not be surprised if people um, put that on the forehead or uh, do that to get the degree. And remember, the COVID is a low-grade um, fever, so that happens sometimes. Um, other things, encourage employees to telework. Uh, you can ask employees if they've been absent from work for the, what's the, med if there's been a medical reason, you can ask and say, why were you out? And you can ask employers to require doctor notes to certify they are fit for duty if they've had symptoms of the COVID-19. But remember that our healthcare providers are busy. Um, they don't always have time to do that. And, you know, that's something that you may do with the self-certification and they put that out as well. And I know we've created some self-certification forms for policies as well. Um, so it's, it just depends on the circumstances, get advice on that. Uh, but we are given more flexibility during this pandemic um, for all these reasons. Now, if you're hiring, the next PowerPoint talks about that. What are you doing to screen employees and applicants, I mean? If you make a conditional job offer, um, can you revoke it if, if someone gets the symptoms? And you can, you can delay the start date. So it's telling you from the EOC, you can withdraw a job offer when an applicant can't start immediately and they have COVID symptoms and they're going to be out of work for 14 days and they can't safely enter the workplace. It also, um, EOC is backing. And the reason we went to a few different categories is because OSHA has one view. Earlier we saw Department of Labor and IRS has two different views um, on some things and the EOC now has chimed in on things. So you do have to know which law you're under. And what do they say and try to figure out how to navigate them? A lot of them are consistent. There's a few differences in each. So um, the EOC says that employers can require employees to wear personal protective equipment. Um, the other next PowerPoint just says the companies cannot compel employees to take vaccines. So the ADA covered companies should consider simply encouraging employees to get vaccines when they become available. Um, it's, it's an issue that's come up a number of times. So if you think about it, you know, we talk about it's being contagious. We're trying to flatten the curve for coronavirus. How does it compare? Well, the flu, we always like people to get flu shots. That's very dangerous. If you do get the real influenza, you don't have a flu shot. It's a very dangerous thing. That's why everybody wants people to get flu shots. Not quite as contagious as coronavirus. Coronavirus in the middle, COVID-19. 
which is more contagious. But the one that's more contagious on the scale is measles. So people are not getting their measles vaccines today. And that's a more uh, contagious one than, than COVID-19. So keep that in mind on the scale where this one fits in. But when the vaccine's available, so far people couldn't, couldn't actually um, uh, force the issue to make them get the flu shot. And we'll see how it works when we get the COVID-19. All right, now let's talk about those protocols for positive COVID-19 at a job site. For 24 hours, you're supposed to close the facility or the area, open the doors and windows if you can, put the and disinfect. The person who has COVID-19 um, shouldn't return to work for 72 hours until they've had 72 hours with no fever without the aid of medication or other symptoms have improved also and seven days after initial onset. So if someone tests positive um, and uh, they, could, they wait 72 hours with no fever, with no medication, and their other symptoms have improved and it has to be seven days after they come back to work. So it's a shorter time period for those that are positive than people who are exposed. So as this PowerPoint tells you, if you're exposed, you're supposed to quarantine if you have close contact with the employee. Quarantine for 14 days. No close contact, then you just monitor and if, if you note know things, then you stay out of the workforce and self-isolate. You also have to decide how to communicate with third parties. You may consider business continuity insurance. Some of that is excluding pandemics or disease. Work with your broker, work with your legal counsel to figure that out. And don't rely on coverage unless you receive confirmation. You may have to restructure your business, like we said, some distilleries in Arizona started making hand sanitizer, so they really improvised and moved on, and that's been great. Now, other business considerations on PowerPoint 73. What about your new hires and applicants? Throughout this next year to 18 months, while we wait for a vaccine, you're going to have to hire people. You're going to have to work on that. How do we do that and still minimize impact in the workforce and not, and not spreading things? We'll consider whether your new hire paperwork can be completed electronically through programs such as DocuSign or Adobe Sign. Consider whether orientations can be done electronically or are web-based. Put the paperwork in boxes and have them retrieve it from the box so that the applicant so that there's no personal exchange and people remain at a distance. You have to change out and clean with the pens that they use. Consider wearing dust masks and gloves. A lot of people are putting plexiglass dividers between the HR personnel and the applicants. The same is happening in our grocery chains and food service. They're putting that plexiglass there. So that's happening and popping up all over to help minimize that spread. The number one way is by talking directly to someone. Consider having individuals complete paperwork at the desk or table outside. I've moved a lot of people in construction and landscape to outside tables to do things. Make sure you clean them regularly between usage. All right, we're going to wrap up with scenarios now. Um, so hopefully this has been helpful, but we think we all learn best by scenarios. Everybody does. So let's start with scenario number one. So that's on the next page. And Suki's moving. Poor Suki's having to do all the PowerPoints on this, so um, she's been doing great. Um, so scenario number one is on PowerPoint 74, and I'll start talking about it while she's getting that moved. So Jane Smith is the project manager for a construction company. In her role, she's required to be on the project site on a regular basis to meet with the owner rep, meet with subs, oversee them, meet with government inspectors. Overall, as a project manager for construction, she's got to make sure that project's on track. Just before COVID-19 was declared a pandemic, Jane went on her honeymoon to Europe, including a stop in Italy. When she returned to the U.S., she was not displaying any symptoms of COVID-19. The current CDC guidance provided that travelers returning from a country with a level three travel health notice generally should self-quarantine for 14 days after leaving the high-risk country. Okay, so what do we know on the next one? Can the company ask Jane illness-related questions? That's the first question we have. Yes, the EOC has issued guidance on pandemic preparedness under the ADA and allows questions to be asked. What are those possible questions? So PowerPoint 75 will list them for you so you can borrow those and use them. Um, the EOC has given us those possible questions. So 2A, B, and C on PowerPoint 75 lay that out. Have you or a person you've been in close contact with been diagnosed with COVID-19 within the last 14 days? Have you returned from a region designated by the CDC as high risk within the last 14 days? And have you experienced cold or flu symptoms to include fever, cough, and runny nose or sore throat 
respiratory illness, difficulty breathing in the last 14 days? So those are questions you can ask. A lot of companies have been doing that and they're having people certify each day on these questions before they can go into the work site. Um, so don't be surprised if more of that pops up. It happens at the airport too. And any information obtained is retained as confidential. You're not allowed to tell, even if people come forward and say, I've got, I had a positive test. You're not allowed to disclose that to others. That's protected by HIPAA. Um, and uh, you just can talk about there's someone exposed in this location and then go through the normal steps. And we have a protocol letters to send the employees who test positive, the employees who are exposed, the close contact employees exposed, and then third parties like customers or co other, other companies. So there's a process for that. All right, now, what about this? The next part point is, can the company require her to stay away from work for 14 days because she went to Europe? Seems like a hot spot where she went. She went to Italy. So the answer is yes. During this period where COVID-19 is classified as a pandemic, a company can require employees who travel outside the U.S. to high-risk countries to self-quarantine for 14 days. Employees can use paid leave if available and subsequently can be unpaid for hourly employees. If a salary worker is staying home at the requirement of the company, though, then they must be paid their salary for any work week in which they perform work. So you have to be very clear when people are not working, work, you furlough them or lay them off. Laid off, they're not workers anymore. Pay may be required by a collective bargaining agreement if there's unions or employment contract, and you have to still apply the Families First Coronavirus Response Act, which we talked about at the beginning on the two leaves. And because of that situation, uh, that would probably cover her leave if it's obviously a covered employer. They meet the requirements. All right, then we still go on to the next page, which is can the company require Jane to obtain clearance from a healthcare professional before returning to work? Well, yeah, a company can require an employee to obtain a clear test or another doctor's clearance before returning to work if they were kept out of work because they were showing signs. But we also know they can go 72 hours uh, if they were positive. They can go 72 hours without a fever and other symptoms dissipating without the aid of medication. And seven days after onset, they can come back to work. If they were exposed, a close contact exposure means self-isolate 14 days. The USC guidance specifically states that the healthcare certification can be required, but keep in mind our healthcare professionals may be busy and they may not be able to um, help with that. We need, but that's why we're doing self-certifications as a backup to that. Okay, um, the next one, Oh, the other one. Can, can the company allow Jane to work remotely? What factors do you consider? Well, we sort of covered that, and let's talk about it. So some of Jane's tasks may be able to be conducted from home, such as computer work or telephone or video conferences, rather than in person. But other parts can't be. She has to be on site. So you're trying to avoid her being on site, but she has to be on site. So she needs to follow best practices. She's part of essential workers to get that construction project done. And so she should be following that. Um, and so it's your discretion as a company, if you're an essential service provider, to allow some community. And um, just remember that those are some of the details you have to work with. All right, let's go to scenario number two. Joe is a tile installer. He comes to work on Monday coughing and a little flushed. His coworkers are expressing concern over working with him. What can the company do? Well, can you send employees home when sick? So can the company send Joe home based on his cough? The CDC guidance states that employees showing signs of COVID-19 should not come to work, and if they are at work, should leave the workplace. The EOC has stated that during a pandemic, companies have the right to require employees who are showing symptoms of COVID-19 or the flu to stay away from the workplace. So you have the right, you can send them home, um, and that's where you get into those controls. The company has to make decisions, and you need to have a policy that requires um, you know, employees to report. How about can the company take its temperature? Well, ADA, the Americans with Disabilities Act, typically restricts medical exams to those that are job related and consistent with business necessity or based on a reasonable belief the employee poses a direct threat to the health or safety of others. So this is where COVID-19 comes in as a pandemic. And the EOC would consider it a direct threat to bring COVID-19 into a workplace so they do allow taking a uh, employee's temperature with those guns um, if people, when those come out. Um, some are doing them now, some are not. Remember that most people are asymptomatic and could be positive without even having a fever. So people really have to, it's all about the contact and communicating about it. 
Can the company ask Joe if he's had any symptoms of COVID-19 or whether he's been exposed? Yes, we talked about those questions. You don't have to wait till someone shows sign of illness to ask. In the case of a pandemic, you can ask employees to certify or affirmatively notify um, and instruct them not to come to work if they've had an issue. All right, I think we have one more scenario, scenario three. Sam is a member of a six person crew. Last week, they worked on a project together. Sam was not showing any symptoms of COVID-19. No flu, no illness, nothing. The crew went directly from their homes to the job site and did not come to the office or interact with other crews. On Monday, Sam calls and says that he's tested positive for COVID-19. What can the company do regarding Sam? And what can the company do regarding the other five coworkers who work with Sam and who may have been exposed? So this can be an office environment, it can be out in the field, um, anywhere. We have one person who doesn't have any symptoms at all. He tests positive, now we've got five coworkers. Okay, we can as a company and should require the employee who's been testing positive to stay out of the workplace. That's number one. Do not allow the employee with COVID-19 symptoms to return to work until again, symptom free for three days, 72 hours, without the aid of medication and seven days after onset. Keep up to date with CDC guidelines if this has been changing. If the employee is ill but has no COVID symptoms, they have to be completely treated three, free for 24 hours before returning and that's under an Arizona rule, Arizona Health Department guidance on that one. So those are non-COVID-19 symptoms but still ill. And you can require a medical certification from employees or a healthcare, but healthcare resources are scarce, so you can use a self certification. The company should notify the coworkers, though, of a potential exposure. So now we deal with how do we notify the coworker? We have protocol letters we suggest, and we have a different letter that's for close contact employees, and those people would be out for 14 days from the exposure. They may qualify for unemployment because it's COVID related, they may qualify for other things. If they've had no close contact, they should monitor for symptoms and address it if they have symptoms. The company cannot identify which employee has been exposed or diagnosed with COVID-19. The ill person has certain privacy rights under the ADA and HIPAA, so you don't go tell everybody who it is. Now, the next pair, the next PowerPoint talks about cleaning and disinfecting the area. We talked a little bit about that. There's a lot of professional companies in town. Um, you close the area for 24 hours and open the windows and doors if possible. Sanitize and disinfect, fog the AC, clean the carpets, fog all rooms. So there's some services right now. We brought some out Sunday to job sites and company sites and it worked great. So that was a, a good thing to do. All right, I think we have time for just one more scenario. Um, Sally's a receptionist, scenario, scenario number three, or number four, sorry, got the number one, scenario number four. Sally's a receptionist at the company's headquarters. She's got asthma and cardiopulmonary. There's not been any report of COVID at the workplace. Sally's afraid though with her current breathing issues, she's more susceptible to COVID. And if she gets it, she has a higher chance of it being a severe case. Her husband also works at the company as an estimator. Sally goes to the company and says, hey, can I work remotely or take time off because I'm fearful of contracting it. I don't have any symptoms. No one in my household does. I just am fearful. She also asked the same accommodations be made to her husband so he cannot, so he doesn't pick it up and bring it home. And then she says, I want everyone in the company wearing face masks at all times. So what are the company's considerations and options? Well, let's learn from this one. OSHA says that employees are only entitled to refuse work if it's imminent danger. That's something that's gonna happen quick. That's a serious harm. So most people from a fear standpoint with no symptoms are not gonna meet that standard. Now, if it's a known danger in the workforce and where the risk of contracting is not imminent, it's not a known danger right now for COVID-19, OSHA wouldn't require Sally and her husband be given time off because of a fear of potentially getting COVID-19. So that is described on this PowerPoint 88 on the OSHA rules, how they would analyze it. But let's go to the next PowerPoint, how the Department of Labor analyzes it. The Department of Labor guidance suggested initially with everything that they did the week before, that FMLA or other leave may not apply to fear or acquiring COVID. You had to actually be ill or have symptoms or care for someone with symptoms. But now they've changed those regulations just lately. Instead, instead, instead state that a government order of quarantine uh, means you can stay home and they've advised categories of people with asthma from the CDC to stay home if there's an outbreak. So she may be entitled two weeks paid leave under F-spot if the employer has fears of 500 employees and is covered by the law. 
And employees who are at a high risk group have been advised to stay at home may be able to collect unemployment during this time. So that's all brand new and changed in the past few days. But there are some ADA considerations, Americans with Disabilities Act comes into play because you've got a chronic condition of asthma. You know, you consider the interactive dialogue you have to have, but a temporary leave is a reasonable accommodation. Remember those rules under the ADA, always. The interactive dialogue with the employee and make your accommodation. The employer chooses the accommodation, but it's part of that process. You consider discretionary unpaid leave as an accommodation for someone who's fearful about that. This could apply to Sally's husband and to Sally if the other provisions don't apply. So that's the ADA, and then the last point we'll wrap up on is the last PowerPoint, which is on, can you force everybody to wear masks? How does that work? Well, companies generally are not required to compel employees to wear face masks unless in a healthcare setting or because of OSHA requirements. The EOC has stated that if the employers do have the right to require it, or any other PPE, and OSHA does too, um, the original guidance from CDC has suggested that individuals not wear face masks unless there was a business reason to do it, but now they're saying you should wear one. So your answer is you can choose to do that if you like. Um, they're making a lot of, you know, cloths with that, things of that nature, um, and it might be helpful to you. So, you know, you can decide. And for the last thing, I'm just going to let you know, we're not going to get to the last couple points, but if you go to, if you can go to PowerPoint 98, on PowerPoint 98 and then following that, 99, 100, we put down a quick list of action items and deliverables, things that we just summarize our whole presentation today on PowerPoint 98, and it talks about potential action items for businesses. It does a checklist for you as we wrap up. So there's like one through, let me see on here, one through 14 is on it. It goes through all the summary from your telecommuting policy, the COVID-19 prevention preparedness plan. There's the list. Thank you, Suki. And that just helps you out with the same things we talked about in a summary checklist. So we have covered a lot. We're sorry, a little bit on the technical difficulties, but I think we got through it all. Um, and we want to remind people that um, go back to the material and um, your leader will get those out to people and make those available. And we appreciate all your time and attention to, to learning the rules, being proactive, um, and again, be flexible. You know, things are going to change. This is going to go on for a while. It's a new way of living until we get that vaccine for another year or more. And we hope this has been helpful. So, Anne, I don't know if you want to wrap up with any comments, but thank you all for your attention. This is Julie Pace and Heidi Nan Gillen signing off from Damage and Burnham and kicking it back to Anne. All right. Um, thank you so much, Julia. This has been some great information. I'm hoping we might be able to take a question or two before we wrap up. Would you guys still be able to answer uh, some of the popular questions that have come in? Absolutely. Happy to do that. All right. Well, I'll turn it over to Suki, who's monitoring the Q&A. So, uh, Suki, take it away. Um, actually, Anne, Heidi has been going through all of the Q&A questions that have come up and she's answered them um, and published those to the audience. Oh, I just so can you not be able to. Oh, perfect. She's muted with it. So the Q&A has been um, being answered by Heidi as Julie's been going through the slides. Oh. So that's yes. fantastic. Um, yeah, we have two. We have a team approach, and we have Heidi doing all the questions while I'm going through it all, and it kind of works with a good team on that. So it kind of helps people. And if there's things afterwards, um, Ann and Suki can send us the list, and we've got our team coming back next Friday, and we can answer them as well. So we'll figure that out. Awesome. So thank you. Well, a huge thank you, Julie and Heidi, for being here today and walking us through all of this incredible information. Um, it's been incredibly helpful to really get into some of the details and walking through some of the scenarios that businesses are um, going through these days and just appreciate the expertise. And thank you to all the attendees who tuned in today. We will be getting a recording of this out to you all and uh, just wishing everyone a safe and healthy weekend and happy Easter. Thank you.